So the next person that I have the um, honor of introducing is one of our speakers who has been in Albemarle now for about three and a half hours this afternoon, that's all. And he, get, he wins the award for the most miles flown today, or he and his cohort do. Christopher Mitchell is the director of the Community Broadband Networks Initiative. He, his work focuses on telecommunications and helping to ensure that communities have that reliable broadband network. He is a leading national expert on community-led broadband network and speaks at conferences across the United States on this subject. He was honored as the 2012 Top 25 in the Public Sector Technology by Government Technology, which honors the top doers, drivers, and dreamers. I love that. Doers, drivers, and dreamers in the nation each year. On a day-to-day -day basis, Chris runs MooneyNetworks.org, a comprehensive online clearinghouse of information of community-led broadband. He earned his master's degree in public policy from the University of Minnesota and a bachelor's degree in political science from McAllister College. Please join me all the way from the Twin Cities, as he would say, Chris. I, uh, I think I'm going to use this so I can look around a little bit. because I have this habit of swaying around. Um, when I started giving public presentations, one of the things that a uh, co-founder of my organization told me was to always dress up. Because if you don't know what the audience is going to be wearing, you want to at least be more dressed up than them to make the appropriate impression. So when I got off the plane, I got to my hotel room, I opened my suitcase, I realized these were the only pants I brought. <laughs> Jeans. My son is three years old, and he stole some of my attention while I was packing, which uh, um, I suppose is only fair because if I was home, I'd be shoveling with him, and he's missing out on that, exper uh, that experience, so he got his revenge. Um, we left Minnesota this morning quite early, not sure if we'd make it. They were calling for eight to ten inches of snow. Fortunately, we came in a little bit less than that. Um, the high degree, uh, the height for today, I think, is in the low five or six degrees. On Wednesday and Thursday, we're looking at um, a high temperature of like negative 10 degrees. So I'm so thankful <laughs> for you all coming out and letting me come here. I, I really appreciate that. What I want to talk about is, um, is what, we want, what we want from our broadband networks. And that is our networks to work like other utilities that we're used to. I, I frequently say this, and some people have heard me say it twice today probably already. I don't have to turn off the lights in my house to use my toaster. And that is incredible. Any device that I go out and buy, I bring it home, I know it's going to work when I plug it in. That's what we're looking at for the future of the internet. I, I don't want to convince you all about a certain number of megabits per second tonight. I don't want to talk about, I don't even mention that word again probably. Uh, because what it's about is a future of abundance in which these things just work for us. You turn on the tap, there's more than enough water for most of us. Um, that's the way it should work. That's the future we're driving toward. So that's the frame of what we're looking at. There's um, a question as to why this is so important. And one of the interesting things about internet policy is that if you look at two communities that are just 10, 20, 30 miles apart, they could be paying 100 times difference for business broadband services. We wouldn't stand for that in, um, in other utilities. And in fact, there are publicly owned gas stations. I know of at least one in Kentucky because they could not find anyone to provide gasoline at a reasonable price. And it was so important, the community stepped in. Um, you know, when it comes to electricity, we think of some states as having fantastically high electricity prices because they might be twice as much or three times as much. But a difference of 100, in, in extreme cases, 1,000 times for the similar service. Um, this is why communities get into it. And that's why my organization, which I'll talk about in a second, why we're motivated by it. It's why cities have gotten involved in it. The final introductory thought that I want to talk about briefly is, again, getting back to this idea, which I, I've had a couple people ask me already, is you know, what speed do we need? And there's a lot of different answers to that. Some of them are, are quite technical. But fundamentally, if you think of the internet as being like a highway, it works best when it's not congested. When it is congested, things go poorly. And so the speed that we need depends on how we're using it 
and what we can do without congestion. Because fundamentally, we don't want to be waiting on the network. In a lot of places, they've just settled on this term a gigabit, which means 1,000 megabits a second, which doesn't really mean much to most people and doesn't really matter, frankly. What matters is the idea that it's more than enough to do not just what you want to do, but what your family members want to do, what the people uh, in your business are trying to do, all at the same time, so they're not colliding with each other. And so when we're looking at this, fundamentally we're looking at high capacity technologies like fiber optics or increasingly fixed wireless, a technology that five years ago I didn't think would make the cut, but increasingly does, at the very least, as a temporary solid alternative um, while we're building out fiber optic networks. So when people say something like, you don't need a gigabit or you can't use a gigabit, they're thinking of this as like a highway in which, oh, we could park so many cars on there if, we're just, if we just cram more cars onto that connection. What we want is an interstate that just flows. And so that's the, thing, that's the metaphor you want to be thinking about, where we're not facing congestion, regardless of the number of megabits or gigabits per second. My organization was founded about 45 years ago. We're kind of an odd co group uh, in that we work on, in a number of different areas, but not with a real like left or right focus. We focus on, um, sorry, every now and then I feel like the microphone's going in and out and it's distracting because I want the whole world to be able to hear this audio. <laughs> um, we, we really focus on what makes local communities strong. And I often say that I want communities to be able to do things that I don't think my community should do. Um, I've said this and my, the co-directors of my organization really don't like it when I say it, but I think communities should be able to do stupid things. Because sometimes, something that I think is stupid is actually not stupid. And also because we should be experimenting to try and find the best policies. And so, it's not the tagline for my organization. Communities should be able to do stupid things. Um, but fundamentally, we believe communities should be able to make their own decisions, to be able to succeed on their own terms. And um, to make those decisions, it also means uh, both political and economic power. Which means they have to have the authority to make decisions. And they have to have strong local businesses so that they have economic self-determination so they feel confident in making their own decisions. This is a, one of the most commonly cited photos when you look back to the Rural Electrification Administration. And it's really quite fascinating when you really dig into the history of rural electrification. The exact same policy arguments came up time and time again, sometimes verbatim. You can look at a 1906 issue of Moody's Magazine in which they were debating public ownership of the infrastructure, uh, whether or not the private sector could do everything, whether or not having co-ops or municipalities might lead to socialism that would destroy the, the American experiment. Um, fortunately, it didn't. Um, we have uh, electrified the country by using private investment, by using municipal investment, and by using cooperative investment. That's what it's going to take for internet access too. And the most important thing that I think I want people to take away from tonight is to go home knowing that we are going to have high quality broadband to each of your homes. If you have great electricity, we are going to get high quality broadband to you. It could take seven years if we were really rapid about it and worked really hard to most people. I'm guessing some people might wait 20 years. And so what we're going to talk about tonight I hope will help Stanley County implement the kinds of policies that will make it go more rapidly. Because I do think we're going to connect everyone ultimately. And when people say it's too hard, <laughs> it's worth remembering. These people were working around the time of a de depression of which we can barely imagine, followed by a world war that, that was beyond comprehension. We still found the resources and capacity to connect everyone to the grid. So I feel like we're up to the challenge. We already have the poles. Um, that they put in the ground. We can reuse them in many circumstances. And so it's when I'm giving this speech, sometimes someone will say to me, and in fact, um, a staffer for a US representative said, well, we're never going to get fiber across the prairie. And my stock answer to that now is, well, we probably won't do it again, but it's already there. Cooperatives have connected most of North Dakota. And when I say most of North Dakota, I actually mean the parts of North Dakota where few people live. If you have bad connections in North Dakota, you probably live in one of the cities. Um, and even there, it's, it's all right. I mean, the cable companies do a good job. 
So this happened without people really noticing. This is a map of fiber optic cooperatives. The difference between the colors is just whether or not the cooperative advertises a gigabit. At this point, South Dakota and North Dakota regularly come in as two of the fastest states for broadband access in the United States. And so again, I just want to make it very clear. We can solve this, and a number of states kind of already have. Cooperatives have done an amazing job on a limited budget to uh, bring connectivity in areas in which it would otherwise be prohibitive. So let's just keep that in mind. We can do this, and I believe we will do this. Now I want to talk a little bit about more locally, where we, we wanted to look at where the federal government is already putting subsidies from one major program called the Connect America Fund into Stanley County. And it's worth noting there's a fair amount of money coming in. And, and you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, I'm not putting this up here to say that these companies that are receiving these subsidies are bad. I think the program that is delivering these subsidies, which if memory serves, AT&T is getting $3.5 million every year to connect um, North Carolina, certain household areas, certain uh, census blocks in North Carolina with, um, with a, what we would call a not broadband. It's a connection that's slower than what would be considered broadband. Uh, CenturyLink's getting $10 million a year. So there's, there's money that's available. I think if it was redirected to entities that had more of an incentive to serve the local community, that that would be better. And I really want to stress, it's not because these companies are bad. It's because they're structured in a specific way to focus on their shareholders. And many of us probably have pensions that are getting dividends from those companies. So we don't necessarily want them to be run in a, in a different way. But we want to make sure that we're subsidizing the right entities that are going to make the investments that are going to support our communities for many years. So don't be fooled into thinking that it's too expensive or, um, or that there's no money available. There's money available. It's just going in through the wrong places, I believe, right now with the wrong requirements on those dollars. So what can be done? There's a really great approach that came out of Minnesota. Uh, farm country, a county with um, on the order of 8,000 households um, over 700 square miles or so. And they worked for five or six years only to <laughs> have it not work out. <laughs> and so they worked for another couple of years and they found a path to build the network that they wanted. And one of the reasons that they did it was because the people who were organizing it were so frustrated having nothing. There was a, a family that was farming the same land for four generations. And the parents had two children in school. And they thought they'd have to leave the farm because they were harming their children by remaining in that area. Because their children would not have the same opportunity to education and other benefits moving forward if they didn't have better broadband. And they came up with a solution. Uh, we described that solution here. It's too complicated to get into now. But the point is that what separates communities in which we see this problem solved from communities in which it doesn't get solved is local organizing and passion. Because almost everyone that's done anything in this space has ha not had their first plan work out. It's only the second plan, the third plan, the fifth plan that have worked out. I've worked in communities that have lots of money available. Palo Alto has like $25 million sitting in the bank in which they are thinking um, they've earmarked it to be only used for fiber. And for like 10 years, they haven't figured out how to spend it. They're kind of just stuck. I've met other communities who have not spent an effective dime. They've, they've, they've come up with ways of reinvest reinvesting existing telecom budgets and have built fiber out to neighborhoods and done incredible things without being able to just um, bond for it or use other financing. Um, because they are creative and dedicated. And so those are the sorts of stories I think are important to surface and to recognize that it's the local initiative that really makes a difference. Somebody has hijacked my presentation. Let's see. Ooh. I'm not sure why it's not going. Does anyone know where Owen is? Ah, someone got it. All right. I'm sure it was something I did, not something that Owen did, unless that was me. I think I want to go back one. I think, did someone just switch it for me? Or did I do that? Ah. So at this point, I'm not really sure who's controlling it. But 
It's much appreciated. This is a map. It's a little bit old. Our new map, we just updated the numbers, and we're tracking electric cooperatives now. But these are cities that have built networks. Um, and uh, there's about 500 of them um, using various models. One of them is Wilson. And Wilson is incredibly exciting, I think, because Wilson um, is possibly, if I, had, if I had to pick one municipal network to move to, it would probably be Wilson in North Carolina. They are doing such remarkable things, not just in terms of trying to figure out how to bring jobs to town, which they've done, but making sure that low-income folks can afford it. Um, not just that, but families who maybe have really bad credit, who would have trouble getting on uh, a cable or, or DSL package, they have ways to sign up. And so I bring this up because, unfortunately, North Carolina has really um, limited the opportunities for other cities to do what Wilson's done or what other communities have done with more um, with, with approaches that have used less risk. And I think it's unfortunate. Um, in 2011, the legislature went down a path of believing that limiting local authority would lead to more private investment. And, uh, and I really hope that we see that um, um, a, a change of heart in the legislature and that they free up more opportunities for local um, experimentation. So uh, one of those models is actually terrifically exciting. How many people in here, whether you have broadband in your home or not, how many of you would be interested in paying like $15 a month on top of the 50, the 50 or $60 connection? So we're talking about $65, $70 a month to be able to get high quality access in your home. Yeah. So if we funded our networks similar, or if we allowed communities that chose to, to fund their networks in the way that we do sewer extensions and things like that, we'd be looking at, um, at um, improvement districts that would allow that. Um, you amortize it over 20 years, and it's amazing. You can, um, you, we have a lot of the neighborhood buying in. The cost of extending fiber networks is actually like the cheapest infrastructure, cheaper than roads, cheaper than electricity, a lot cheaper than water. It's remarkable how, um, how low cost this is when you compare it to other infrastructures. Look at how much it costs to build a, build a bridge or maintain a road. Um, and, then, and then you can look at um, the different financial models one could use to expand fiber optic networks. It's less costly than we think when it's structured correctly. Oh, and this little town in, in Idaho, we made a video about it. It's 20 minutes long, so I'm not going to play it here. But this little town is just doing amazing things. This guy who is running it, the city's IT director, he started as a plumbing inspector. He could well revolutionize how networks are built in small to medium-sized cities around the country. Um, networks that then result in robust competition, where the public owns the network, where citizens finance it, and then they have a choice of multiple providers on it. It's remarkable. And, and that's how history is made, these little towns doing interesting things. Um, there's other models in terms of conduit. And I think this is one of the things that cities need to think very carefully about. Because if you're doing existing projects, putting conduit in the road and making sure that's available on reasonable terms with a simple sign up uh, for companies that want to use it. Um, is really important for lowering the cost of investment, whether from incumbents or whether from new entrants into the market. And so all cities and counties should be really figuring out how to make sure Public Works is enthusiastic about this to, get, to um, improve the communities. So we did a map of um, North Carolina and where we're seeing rural fiber from co-ops. And again, I think you'll see in the Northwest, you're going to learn more about Wilkes um, there um, and what they're doing with River Street Networks. Um, there's a lot of exciting action happening with uh, fixed wireless, which Alan's going to talk about briefly today. Um, but the, w one of the important things I wanted to show is that parts of North Carolina in rural areas have better connectivity than you can find in Charlotte. And so the question is how to bring this everywhere. So as I'm finishing up, I just want to come back to this. Um, because it's, it's important to look at this and think, almost everyone in North Dakota has fiber. <laughs> There's, I was, I was talking to someone in, um, I think it may have actually been here last year. Um, I was in Raleigh for the um, Rural Assembly. Um, and, and they were talking about how um, they lived in North Carolina now, I believe. And they had gone back to the family home in western North Dakota and knocked on the door to say, my family, my wife was born here. We'd like to see you know, what it's like. And uh, the person who answered the door said, oh, yeah, come on in, you know, and showed them around. And they were talking. And, they asked the people who live there today, what do you do? And the woman said, I work for a Colorado school district. <laughs> and said, well, how do you do that? Well, I have fiber optics in my home. I can work anywhere. And so lives in North Dakota. And, um, 
and works for a Colorado school district. You know, in some ways, I don't want to give this presentation too much because if you're familiar, people from California have been taking over a lot of different places, and they're starting to move to the Dakotas. And I think the fiber is a part of that. <laughs> people in North and South Dakota don't really want that so much. Um, but I wanted to, I just want to make sure that it was very clear that we are seeing this problem being solved. It's generally not being solved by the incumbent providers. Not because they're bad, but because if you're a windstream, if you're a CenturyLink or a Frontier, you operate both in rural areas and more urban areas where you're competing with cable, like here. Which means the telephone companies for years have been missing, have been losing subscribers to cable. And as they respond, the place where they can try to make sure they're going to be a profitable company is by fighting for subscribers in urban areas. CenturyLink's CFO last year was quite clear in saying, we are focused on our urban areas and our enterprise areas because it's our best path to, again, being a profitable company. They're going to continue to invest at the minimum amount necessary to meet, to meet the requirements of the federal programs that they've signed up for. But fundamentally, if we're all honest, CenturyLink does not see itself as having a major future in rural areas. And so I think we can all win by trying to make sure that CenturyLink succeeds as a company by being competitive and not feeling like it should be the one connecting Stanley County. Stanley County, I think, ultimately will be best served by a connection that is local to North Carolina. Tonight we're going to talk about some of those options. Um, and we move to a world in which where there's possible private sector competition, we aim for that. And we may even see public investment to make that go further. But in rural areas, we recognize the best business models are ones that are centered in those areas. So that's the message I wanted to bring. And I want to, um, before I introduce um, our next speaker, we're going to have a panel, and they're just going to give some introductory comments. Um, I want to say we're in a municipal meeting space. And so I very much appreciate any constructive criticism that you want to have. This is the, the spirit of places like this, if you want to tell me what I got wrong. Um, that would be great. If you want to tell me what I got right, I'll be surprised, but appreciative. Um, you should feel free to um, come up afterward and uh, share that criticism, um, as we regularly see with, um, in these meeting spaces. You know, I knew that this would happen. There we go. So now I'm going to bring up the proper title, Dr. Ken Russell the VP of Digital Transformation and the CIO of Pfeiffer University. Thank you. Hi, folks. One thing I always like to say is I always like to say greetings from Meisenheimer. And I have to tell you, every time I say that, whether I'm in North Carolina or I'm in California, places like that, I love it because I think everybody here, for once, knows where Meisenheimer is. But you'd be surprised when, when I'm actually at some of the places, um, somebody in Texas will raise their hand because they know where Meisenheimer is. That's really kind of cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you a few dates here to kind of get us started. I've only got a few minutes. Uh, and as uh, the old Jerry Reed song goes, I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So I'm going to try to make this really succinct. But please grab me afterwards. We'll, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. But amazing things are happening at, happening at Pfeiffer. Uh, I've been. Uh, back, uh, I say back because 30 years ago I graduated from Pfeiffer and I got married at Pfeiffer. Uh, it's, it's been a part of my life forever it seems. But um, about two and a half years ago I was on the board of trustees and the president Colleen Keith asked me to uh, uh, change that hat for a while and become the uh, university's CIO and vice president for digital transformation. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to give you some definitional terms of digital transformation as I kind of give you the story of what's happening here in Albemarle with our, our new College of Health Sciences. So about two weeks ago, we broke ground on the, uh, the new College of Health Sciences, a 40,000 square foot, four-story building right over here on Main Street. Hope you guys were there. Anybody there and saw that happening? Said, look at those hands. You got to love that, right? Um, it's going to change fundamentally not just what we do with the town uh, and the city and, and the county. Um, it's going to change how Pfeiffer operates. I mean, uh, um, Pfeiffer has some really interesting things going for it, but also has some things going against it with regard to broadband. Um, I can tell you about 10 years ago, when I was uh, at the North Carolina Research Campus and we were building that technology out, uh, I actually tried at that time to get a wireless connection from Kannapolis all the way over to Meisenheimer. It was prohibitively expensive. It was over two, three million dollars 
and the speed would have been, you don't even want to know what the speed was. The technology in those days was, was horrible. But now you fast forward 10 years, and suddenly we're talking about doing a wireless ring around the county. We're talking about speeds that are in the gigabit range, which is amazing. <coughs> and we're talking about the ability to connect uh, not just dozens of people or hundreds of people, but thousands of people in the community. So it's pretty amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of talk around the, uh, what we're doing with the, uh, the campus and the program. So it's a, it's a physician's assistance program in Albemarle, and it's an occupational therapy program. And both of those require lots and lots of bandwidth and lots and lots of data, because if you think about what's happening with uh, education these days, it's not about you know, getting a transcript nowadays, right? You think about the transcript you got when you were in school, it's a piece of paper, it shows the classes, and it shows what your grades were. That's not enough anymore. So nowadays, uh, students need to have access to the uh, portfolio that they've done and they've created during their academic career. So for example, if I'm a, a, a PA student, uh, if I'm looking for a job, I need to show what I've done over that course of my, uh, my academic career. So I need to show the cadaver I sliced up, okay, sorry. <laughs> or, you know, the, the process that I use to, uh, you know, correct something, uh, to, to uh, adjust a knee or something like that. So that all takes data. So I'm going to kind of count this in, in, in four basic words here. Uh, think about how we use data these days. It's how we consume our technology. And it used to be about how we created it. Remember how years ago we cared about things like uh, RAM, we cared about things like hard disk space and how, how large the hard drive was. And I'm getting the same thing about the microphone, so I apologize. Um, but today, when you look at the, your iPhone, for example, you, you don't really care how fast it is or what kind of chip it has in it. You care that you can use Yelp to find the best restaurant in Albemarle. You, you care that you can get an Uber somewhere, right? Right, maybe, maybe. But it's about how we consume our technology, and the same is true for education. Uh, our, our students are coming to us consuming uh, technology in ways they never have before. The second one is this idea of data amplification. So think about data. Uh, one of the most popular terms we have in technology is this idea of data administration, you know, a, a database administrator, that kind of stuff. Well, I'm here to say that in 2019, it's not enough to administer data. We have to amplify what we do with data. And uh, the best example of that I have for you is students who actually uh, use technology to uh, connect and do more things and have access to better databases and things like that. Databases that, you know, they didn't even know about 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And the third one is this idea of collisions, and not the kind of collisions you're talking about earlier. It's this idea of these uh, hallway discussions that we all have, these aha moments of discovery that we make when we have the ability to connect. So it used to be that we had water coolers, right? Remember what our water, water cooler discussion was? We'd all kind of hang out in the hallway and we'd actually meet and we'd talk about things. Well now, the water cooler is digital, and I could talk just as easily to someone in Meisenheimer that I can in, in Perth, Australia. It's instant, and it requires high-speed broadband. But finally, the last word I want to share with this is the idea that our technology requires us to share. So it used to be, actually when I was a student at Pfeiffer, you know, a lot of my professors would tell me that, you know, Ken, it's, the, it's what you know where you get power. It's what you know. Well, I'm here to tell you, that's all changed. It's not what you know that makes you successful and makes you powerful. It's what you share. And that's the thing that broadband allows everybody to do. It's a great equalizer. So before, you know, you, you had only folks that had broadband could actually, you know, take advantage of it. Uh, Alan and I were talking earlier today. There are people out there that don't even know how to use this phone because it doesn't work with low speeds. It's amazing, the divide. So what's exciting about what's happening here in Stanley County and at Pfeiffer and how we're going to connect Pfeiffer to My I mean Meisenheimer to Albemarle is that it's going to equalize everything. So I think that's all I've got time for. So thank you, folks, and please come visit Pfeiffer. That was a slide for Dr. King Russell that I did not put up earlier. <laughs> so now I'm going to bring up Alan Fitzpatrick, the CEO of Open Broadband and co-founder of NC Hearts Gigabit. Thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Alan. I live in Union County, so I didn't have a, a long drive. Uh, but I am the CEO of Open Broadband, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do. 
Uh, we started the company a couple of years ago as a very entrepreneurial North Carolina company, and our mission was to solve the broadband availability problem. If you look across the country, you see these stats. 30% of the census tracts in the country do not have a broadband provider option. They might have internet, but they don't have 25 megabit speed or higher. So think of this as like DSL land or satellite land. It's areas without the, uh, a provider. 48% of the census tracts only have one provider. Maybe it's cable, maybe it's a telecom, but you don't really have a choice. So most of the country. Uh, broadband is defined by the FCC as 25 megabit speed or higher on the download and three megabit speed or higher on the upload. 25 and three. So we set about to solve this problem. Uh, sorry, a little bit of the uh, uh, graphics got transposed here, but the way we designed this is we have a data center in Charlotte and we lease fiber optic circuits. Some of my vendors are in the room. And then we do a fixed wireless implementation in the local community. Uh, we're active in 10 counties in North Carolina today. We do public-private partnerships, which is what uh, Martha Sue was talking about earlier. We partner with counties and towns across North Carolina to give them a broadband choice. Areas that, again, are on DSL or satellite, and they now have opportunity to get 25 megabit speed or better. Some of our example towns are on the right. Uh, I'll get to Stanley County here in just a minute, but we're active in Gaston County and Wayne County and Duplin County, and got a major project going on in Orange County. We launched uh, free public Wi-Fi in downtown Belmont. I'll show you a map of it in a minute, but any citizen who's walking up and down the Belmont streets has free use of uh, broadband. We do use fixed wireless for the last mile connectivity. Uh, this is a picture of our antenna installation on top of a water tower in Mount Olive, North Carolina. We are serving customers like the Mount Olive Airport that was previously using four megabit DSL service. From this tower that you see, they're getting 100 megabit service. 100 by 100, it's symmetrical, up and down. Our model is to start off with residential service from $40. We believe afford affordability is a big issue, uh, particularly in the rural areas. So we try to make service available for everyone. We can go up to gigabit speed wirelessly, just like fiber. Uh, we serve all different types of businesses. We do Wi-Fi zones. Uh, we are North Carolina owned and operated. Even our call center is in North Carolina. You have a trouble ticket, you call open broadband, you're talking to a North Carolinian. You're not talking to somebody from another country. A few of our happy customers, I'm happy that one of them is in the room, uh, Pfeiffer University, but uh, Mount Olive University, we serve uh, the airport, we serve uh, parks, we serve the Charlotte Housing Authority. Uh, we have a public housing development that's using our service. And of course, a lot of residential users. These are pictures of some of our antenna installations. The one on the top left is actually a gigabit antenna. It's about the size of your notepad. So think of this little antenna being about 11 inch square box. We're doing a gigabit speed connection to an orthodontist who is doing imaging files of the patient's mouths and uploading these to Invisalign. And they can do it now in less than a minute. It used to take them 40 minutes to upload that file. Uh, the other pictures are just other implementations using antennas. Uh, we do provide support to entrepreneurship centers. So we serve Packer Place in Uptown Charlotte, if you're familiar with that. Uh, TechWorks, which is a new facility in Belmont. Uh, we're doing gigabit fiber to the building as well as high speed uh, wireless internet. And we have another one coming on South Boulevard, a, a new entrepreneurship center called Tabris. We serve residential as well, so these are some of the photos we have. Uh, the two on the right are actually in a neighborhood in Sanford, North Carolina, and uh, one of our partners there is Conterra Broadband, who's in the room. So uh, thanks to their fiber, we were able to take that connection, wirelessly extend it into this neighborhood. Previously, this neighborhood was all on DSL, or a hotspot. Now they have 50 megabit service. It's quite an improvement for them. Uh, these are pictures of some of our Wi-Fi zones. In Belmont, we're up and down uh, North and South Main Street. In uh, Mount Olive, we're on North Center Street. Uh, we do this on fields and parks as well. On the left is Pfeiffer University's ball fields. So if you're on the soccer field or the tennis courts or uh, the baseball field at Pfeiffer, uh, you have free public Wi-Fi. 
uh, same in Goldsboro. Public housing, we turned on free Wi-Fi for Dillahay Courts, which is a public housing unit in downtown Charlotte. Every unit, every unit, every resident has free access to the internet. Now they can search for jobs, their kids can be online for school, and take advantage of the other capabilities of the internet. Stanley County, this is gonna be a bit of an eye chart. Our plan is rolling out a gigabit wireless ring across the whole county. We've signed a contract with the county for access to the towers. Uh, we started to line up anchor uh, institutions that are gonna be part of this wireless ring. It's gonna be a gigabit connection between all those dots that you see. And the blue circles are areas where we're gonna serve residential. The residents aren't gonna be able to get a gigabit, but they will get broadband. They will get 25 megabit speed in these circles. This is what we're gonna roll out in Stanley County. The results that we've had as a company are these you see on the board. Taking people from DSL, giving them broadband. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you, Alan. Alan is so enthusiastic about this. I run into him at different places uh, around the country, and um, it's always great to meet people who bring that local passion. Uh, we asked Anita Owen Scott, the co-pastor of New Direction Life Ministries, to present today, in part because I, I think a lot of us come here thinking about why we're frustrated or what we want, and I was hoping that Anita would be able to share a perspective um, of, of what maybe some other people are looking at, and, and it might give you a better sense of how others think about the problem and the challenges they face. So, Anita, please come on up. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, from the faith community perspective um, as it relates to broadband. Um, to be honest, my, my, my closest relationship to even understanding broadband is my brother who works for Spectrum. That's about as close as I come. He climbs the pole. I know that. He climbs the pole. But, but I, I want you to, to understand something about the faith-based community and understand something about churches and all together. Um, church, we, we, we typically think about church as this place where we go and we just worship and we have our crosses on the walls and we have our steeples on the buildings. But if you are part of the faith community and you go to church anywhere or involved in church, period, you know that over the years, and I think since about the 90s, churches have taken, taken a different trend and a different model, um, per se, when it comes to doing church. Many of churches now, they are more like, I don't want to say businesses, but they almost operate, some of them, from a business model perspective. And what happens when churches start operating from that perspective is that they start adding things to them that typically you would find in your community. And I'll, I'll give you some examples. Uh, I don't know of any churches here um, in Stanley County that now operates kind of like a, I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, like an elevation church in Charlotte or some of these other churches that, that come on television, they have all these things going on. But many churches now are um, incorporating into what they do more things that relate to meeting the needs of the whole person. Um, you know, because typically churches just, you know, preach, send you out, and you be good this week and come back and next week and they help you be good again for the next week. <laughs> so. It's, it's not just like that anymore. Now it's more like, okay, we're going to help you, not only we're going to help you be good, but we're going to help you with your child care. We're going to help you with getting jobs. We're going to help you uh, 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 get food. We, we're going to help you um, get your GED or get your high school diploma. So churches now incorporate a lot of different things to help people do a lot of different things. And 
if, if we were in an area where we were greatly affected by the um, uh, federal workers not getting paid, we probably, churches probably would have seen a lot of people coming to get assistance and help in some kind of way. And so our churches in Norwood, and I was sharing with Alan, that we operate um, with a DSL network, and we, uh, Spectrum was sending out um, information as if they were in Norwood, and so we call, hey, baby, we can get some high speed, and they're not even in Norwood yet. And so, but if they were there, then we could access that. The vision for, and I can speak for our church, is that we be more than just a church, and that we provide all kinds of services and all kinds of things to, to people, like I said, in a holistic manner, not just, just ministering to them spiritually, but ministering to their physical needs and their material needs and connecting them with other agencies and connecting them with other organizations and connecting them uh, with, with, with other um, entities that could, could help them in, in many different ways. And so, um, I know in, within Stanley County, uh, there are a couple of churches that are uh, pretty, I, and I'm going to call them progressive, and, um, and they are branching out using these things to, to help in doing ministry and doing ministry in a whole nother way and doing it on a whole nother level and with a whole nother um, perspective, because again, church no longer is about preaching to you and sending you out the door and say be good and come back and be good again. It's 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 really doing ministry in a holistic manner. Um, I'm just going to briefly just shift for a second because education is my heart, and and many of you that know me know I served two terms on the school board, and um, the, the the students who have uh, they're they're able to use phone books and things like that. And there are times when they can't take them home. But imagine living in a community where your Chromebook is no good to you when you get it home because you can't connect to anything. And it, not, now, now, too, teachers are um, connecting with parents through the Internet and, and things like that. And so having that access will mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people in this community. And I'm going to stop. Thank you. I was really hoping to uh, have several presentations that did not get into megabits. <laughs> um, so with that, I want to bring up someone who might. <laughs> um, when, you, when I mentioned the Wilkes on the map of North Carolina, when we were charting out where fiber was in rural America, we found this spot of North Carolina. We're just like, what is going on there? And called Eric Kramer, who uh, we're hoping to have join us as well, who runs that network. And he was, um, he's probably doing some important things. Anytime he's in DC, I'm happy because he's someone they should be listening to. Um, so we have Greg Coltrane, who's working closely with Eric with River Street Networks. Um, his title is the VP of Business Development with River Street Networks. But the important thing is, is that these guys have a vision for connecting everyone and a plan. They're stretching all over the place and I'm, I'm very excited to see where it goes. Thank you very much. I've um, been watching all the previous speakers. I feel like they're having to eat the microphone, so I'm gonna make a few adjustments here. I'm really excited to be with you tonight, and I'm more excited to see the turnout in the room. Um, it's kind of a dead giveaway that the people in this community are very, very much interested in learning how they can get involved, um, how they can stimulate conversation and be a part of making something happen. And that's really what excites me about um, North Carolina. Um, I will tell you a little bit about Wilkes Communications, a uh, 67-year-old independent telephone cooperative. Uh, it was formed to serve rural parts of Wilkes County where nobody wanted to serve. And much like many of the missions with cooperatives across the country, uh, they set forth a plan to build telecommunication services in Wilkes County. And over the years that involved, evolved into the point now where we're a, a more of a broadband company providing customers in Wilkes County. 
Now, I've known Eric Kramer, our CEO, for uh, probably a good maybe 10 or 15 years. And uh, years ago, we started talking about a vision, uh, a vision to see us carry the co-op model uh, further outside of its normal scope, which is where we've served in the past. This was Wilkes County um, just a few short years ago, 2014. Actually, it still is Wilkes County. It's just an image that shows Wilkes County where we serve. Um, but in 2014, the vision was to see the co-op grow across the state. And uh, I happened to be working at the time uh, for a small independent cooperative on the eastern coast of North Carolina. You see there's eight or was eight independent telephone companies in North Carolina. And in August of this past year, we successfully merged both of those two co-ops into Wilkes Communications, doing business as River Street Networks. And so uh, from 2014, we began kind of a flurry of activity. We began to look at small uh, copper-based phone companies in rural parts of North Carolina that uh, seemed to need our help, uh, that offered an opportunity for growth for our company, and we began to spread across the state. This uh, graphic here kind of shows you, and I, I apologize, it's kind of small. hope you can make it out. But this is the expansion that we've had since 2014, just in four years. Um, part of this is uh, through acquisitions. Part of this is through mergers. But our goal was to create jumping points across the state where we could br grow broadband networks in such a way that we could expand to have a statewide cooperative at some point in time when it makes sense. So all of the green activity that you see on the screen is either properties that we acquired, um, areas where we have uh, partnerships forming with county governments, and I wanted to talk really quickly with you and just let you know that um, Chris did an excellent job at the beginning really of kind of laying the ground floor for our discussions tonight because at River Street Networks we feel like it's crucially important that all the stakeholders come to the table. Uh, the, the traditional model for, for companies serving communication services is I build the network that passes your home or residence. I own the network. I manage the network. I support the network. And it's all at my expense. And in a rural market uh, today in eastern North Carolina in these rural areas, it's really expensive to get there with a fiber-based network. So it's important that if someone already has an asset in that community that they can bring to the table in that partnership, maybe it's a, a statewide ring that runs around the state. Um, maybe it's a fiber run that leaves a specific office and runs out into that rural area. Maybe it's a cooperative using cooperative mentalities coming along and saying we're willing to do what was started years ago and basically serve the unserved yet again using the co-op uh, principles that we've learned for the last 67 years. So using all of those networks, we combine them. Each partner has their ownership in those networks, but it helps reduce the overall cost to get to the customer. So we're talking currently with many counties across North Carolina uh, in order to um, to join with them in a relationship that we want to serve the members of their county. We're also working with the electric membership cooperatives in North Carolina to build broadband networks. Um, in, in addition to that, I wanted to speak real quickly about the 26 independent electric cooperatives in North Carolina. It wasn't uh, too many months ago that we were approached by um, the North Carolina Electric Membership Cooperative Association. It's a conglomerate of all 26 EMCs in North Carolina. And they saw our vision. Uh, they had been to several meetings that we were at talking about the partnerships, talking about using fixed wireless to bridge the gap until we could get fiber to these communities, uh, talking about a three-legged bar stool of having county government, electric cooperative, telephone cooperative, uh, any other stakeholders in the community come together to build the networks that need to be built. And out of that, we have formed a new partnership in North Carolina. It's 50% owned between the electric cooperatives and 50% owned between River Street Networks. And what that will afford us to do is use their statewide fiber assets to get to these communities, to these electric cooperatives. And then we'll build 
the last mile service off the electric cooperative's middle mile network. So you have the ring around the state, you have the middle mile, and then you have the last mile out to the customer. And this approach, we feel, is tried and true because the electric cooperatives brought power here and the telephone cooperatives bought phone service here into these rural areas. Why not do it again with broadband? Um, this new partnership will also afford an exchange of um, using the assets in a lease environment where we lease the, the assets in order to serve that customer. So everybody is able to afford to pay back the investments they have in the assets that are in the ground or on the pole. And so we're really excited about this. We've already started uh, multiple, um, uh, multiple what we call pilot programs across North Carolina with several of the EMCs. And uh, if you have any questions later in the venue tonight, I would be glad to try to answer those for you. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Now we're going to have our Price is Right moment where I'm going to have Kathy Ullman come down out of the audience, the President and CEO of Stanley County Chamber of Commerce. And one of the things that um, I really wanted to, to make sure we got across is that we're not here to say any of the existing companies are, are doing a bad job or to create a negative atmosphere. Uh, we truly do believe it takes all of us working together or perhaps independently in the same direction uh, to make sure we all have the connectivity we need. And so we wanted to make sure we heard from a representative of the business community. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you for the opportunity. When uh, Don Melton first contacted me, I said, I'm not a tech person. This is not my area of expertise. She said, but you work with so many businesses and you've worked in this community for so many years, you have to know and understand the need. And I do understand the need. I walked in Stanley County Chamber of Commerce 29 years ago and joined that Chamber of Commerce as a business owner, small business owner. The Chamber doesn't do business the same way today as I don't do business the same way I did 29 years ago. Um, when I walked in as chamber president uh, about five and a half years ago, uh, I'm looking at eight desktop phones and I don't do business that way today as I did five and a half years ago when I walked in. I carry an iPad and a phone and I work all over the county. As I take our 31-year leadership Stanley program all over Stanley County, and we try to work from day to day each month in that program. Uh, we go to places like Mar Mountain State Park. It's hard for everybody to check their messages. It's hard for me to communicate back and forth with my caterers and my logistics people. Uh, so it's a, it's a random hit and miss. Uh, we travel all over, um, even simply to Market Station in downtown Albemarle sometimes, and I think we're working on that hole there where our farmers are trying to sell goods and products. Um, but again, it's hard to do business even in downtown Albemarle. I find it frustrating when I reach out to small businesses and artists in the community that are trying to work together cooperatively and they have a hard time doing business online. Even as a Chamber of Commerce when we hold events here at Atrium Hospital, I have a hard time even using a square to process credit cards. Uh, the office is within sight of this building, just on the other side, and uh, our service is not consistent. So when we look on, online, uh, residential service from Windstream and Spectrum pretty much covers all of the 28001 zip code, but when you look for the business coverage, it's not nearly the same, not nearly as great. And um, I think all of these things are critically important. Uh, Dustin Poplin said here in the room, and Dustin can tell you that I call him and I say, I don't really care how it works, I just need it to work. And I need to make sure it works for our businesses and our business community. It needs to work for everyone throughout the county, all across the rural areas. Um, education, we've talked about Stanley Community College, Pfeiffer University, in our school system, all these things are great. Uh, we talk about business, we talk about industry. One thing I haven't heard mentioned tonight, though, is agriculture. And we take our leadership Stanley class again all over our county, and agriculture is one of the greatest drivers we have in Stanley County. And I can tell you that all the technology that farmers use today, it's critical that they also have broadband access and have reliable, dependent broadband access. 
Um, I listened to something on 60 Minutes the other night, and I don't know how many of you heard Kai Fu Lee talk about artificial intelligence. And it's digital technology that's creating that artificial intelligence. And if anything about his prediction that 40% of our jobs worldwide are going to be replaced by artificial intelligence in the next 15 to 25 years, I, I dare say we've got to get on the band and the bandwagon of broadband. And I'll be glad to make any other comments. I'll be glad to uh, share any other thoughts. But the way we used to do business and the way we're going to do business today and for the future has got to change. And broadband is that next piece of electricity and infrastructure that we're all going to be dependent on. So thank you. I'm going to call the panel up now. Some brief just panel discussion. Uh, Kathy, if you don't mind sticking around, and I'll call the fellow panelists up to grab a seat. Um, we're going to start taking some audience, um, I would say, questions and testimonials in a minute. Uh, we're going to set a microphone up right here, which I think we can do right now. Um, and I wanted to take this moment while we're getting set up to uh, thank several people that, um, or organizations that made this possible. We already thanked them once, but I wanted to say that a year ago, I reached out to Aaron from the uh, National, uh, the North Carolina, the end, North Carolina League of Cities, League of Municipalities, um, with an idea of like, we wanted to do something like this. And we're, we're going to do it in the fall and, and the hurricane hit. And we're going to do it here in January and the government was shut down. I just kept thinking, is it going to reopen on Monday? Is it going to suck all the life out? And then there's a blizzard coming and I, I <laughs> feel like there's a lot of work that went into getting us out here today. And it would not have been possible without um, the North Carolina League of Municipalities really laying a lot of the groundwork. Um, when we finally picked the places we were going to work, my, my hope was that there would be a local person who would do all kinds of work and introductions and I could take all the credit. And uh, Dawn stepped up, um, Dawn Melton, who has spoiled us now. Every other place we're going to go, we're never going to find someone who is as helpful and useful in terms of setting up the, the stage um, and setting it. So I, I very much appreciate that help. Um, our sponsors, um, you know, um, Alan Fitzpatrick and, um, and Greg were essential in, in putting all this together um, with uh, NC Hearts Gigabit. And so, and then also um, um, Ting, which is working with Holly Springs and, and Fuquay, Fuquay Verena are, um, is sponsoring um, our travel. So um, we very much appreciate their, their assistance too. So with that, I want to ask a question. I'm going to come over and join you all after I ask this. But Anita, I want to put you on the spot. And I want to start the conversation just briefly. And this will be very short comments as we sort of go around the table. Um, but when we were talking on the phone, Anita, you mentioned that, um, that the role of parents, making sure they're involved in education, is key to having good outcomes. And I just I wanted to start there because I feel like education is one of the single biggest reasons we have to invest in these networks to make sure that everyone has a, an opportunity to succeed in life. We have two mics to pass around, and you have to really cram it into your teeth. <laughs> As I mentioned in, in, in my um, op opening remarks, the, the students have access to the books, that, which are you know the many computers, if anybody is familiar with the Chromebooks. Um, but again, if they don't have the access, they can't use them. Same thing with the parents. If they have it and don't have access, then it does play a role in how they are able to communicate with their teachers and other administrators and staying on top of what's happening with their children in school. It is, most of the communication is done via email. That's how the parents are communicating with teachers and teachers are communicating with parents now. It is via email and it's important. If we want our children to be successful, then sometimes it also means helping that parent um, in their role so that that child is successful. And if the parents have the ability to communicate, 
um, using whatever technology is available to them and the broadband is there, then it's going to impact the success of the students in the classroom. Great. Ken, can I throw, put you on the spot? And then I'd love to have other panelists jump in too. Sure. We were just following up on education and how this is related. I'm, okay. I'm curious. I mean, do you have a sense of, do Pfeiffer students have all the opportunities when they leave your, um, your um, university to stay in the community and, and innovate and, and do everything they need to do? I, I think they do. I, I think what's interesting about how the, today's student has changed is um, they come to us a, with a great expectation. Uh, in fact, I would say that, uh, you know, it's a very competitive situation for universities. Uh, if you don't have broadband, uh, it's quite possible that a student will just say, say goodbye and go somewhere else that does. So there's a competition factor. But something else I've noticed too, um, today's student, they, they don't just use the internet for academics. Uh, I would probably say that Pfeiffer, for example, uh, you, we have uh, during the day, it's pretty much what you would expect. It's uh, people using our learning management system, which is called Blackboard, and they, they work on their classes, and they, they do all the things they need to do. But sometime around, I'm going to say it's around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, until about 4 in the morning, it's like Pfeiffer becomes a resort. <laughs> I mean, they're doing Netflix, and they're doing gaming, and all those things, and all those things require broadband. So when you ask, are we preparing our students for, you know, coming out in the community and uh, being a part of the community. If that community has broadband, yes. But if we don't have broadband, no, they're going to go someplace that does. There have been studies, actually, uh, that say when uh, given a choice, this new millennial generation uh, of a higher salary or a job that has, you know, you know pretty cool job, but, uh, oh, by the way, there's no bandwidth. There's no broadband, you know, or a job that says, you know, uh, I, I don't have a lot of money for you, but I've got really great broad broadband and I've got like great snacks. Okay, guess which ones they take? It's the job that has less money, great snacks, and great broadband. <laughs> Alan, I, I, go ahead and then I, sure. Okay, just uh, quickly, uh, the number one reason that we hear from customers taking our service is for education. The parents want it for their children. Uh, a lot of people have smartphones. Smartphones are awesome. Try writing a research paper on it, right? Or try learning how to code in Python on your smartphone. It's not going to work. So you need home broadband. So it's really not a substitute. But education is the number one use case we find. I want to I poke you and Greg, who are doing a lot of work to bring better broadband. And I'm curious, because one of the things that, among people I disagree with on broadband policy, sometimes they'll say things like, you're just going all this work so they can download cat videos or Netflix and gaming. And it's just not that important. What do you say to that? That's going to happen, absolutely. Uh, but there are so many other use cases, of course, uh, such as education uh, uh, that come into play. Uh, the quality of life aspect that uh, Dr. Russell was just mentioning, uh, we hear it in the form of people will not move to our community unless there's broadband access. Somebody wants to be a consultant. They want to live in the mountains because it's a beautiful place to live but they can't do that effectively and do their job if they don't have broadband. So the ability to have broadband allows you to live where you want to live. Uh, and for people who are already in a rural area, to stay where they are. So when the kids grow up, they don't leave. And to echo that, you know, we see a decline in a lot of rural counties right now in our school systems. And I don't know, I haven't seen any statistical data that actually shows people are leaving because they don't have broadband. But I would say that that is a huge hindrance for people living in rural areas. If families are trying to make a living and they want to use technology to do so, it's, it's just not, it's preemptive for them to be able to do that in the rural areas that don't have it. Um, we also noticed that the homes that are in rural areas that have access to broadband are afforded all the same luxuries as the home in urban and cities across the country. For instance, Alexa. Um, if you're running, in, in my case, in my home, I have eight Alexa devices. I live in a rural area. <laughs> Maybe I've gone a little bit too over the top this past Christmas, yep. but, um, <laughs> you know, having smart lighting in the home, uh, being able to use other automated services, home surveillance and security, those are also things that people in rural areas or smaller towns 
aren't afforded if they don't have significant access to broadband. So all of these things, and going back to the educational piece and losing students in the schools, losing families in the counties, that places a greater burden from the lack of revenue coming into counties for them to be able to afford the other things they need. So it's really important that everyone comes to the table and, and realizes this could become a crisis in our rural counties in North Carolina. So you don't mind passing it down to, to Kathy. I want to make a mental note to hack your home and mess with your lights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the security on the uh, Internet of Things is not so great yet, folks. <laughs> um, Kathy, I'd love to get a sense of uh, local businesses. You mentioned that there are some challenges. But can you put into perspective, is it a number one issue, a number three issue? And I'm sure it's not the same for all businesses, but I'm wondering if that spurs any thoughts. As you said, it's probably not a number one, two, or three across the board because everybody's needs are different. Um, we all realize that in today's retail world, we're not just competing with the business down the street or the business in the next town. We're competing globally. And so many businesses now actually rely a tremendous amount on the broadband that they have to deliver, to sell, to get the word out. Uh, I recently spoke with a small business who's moved from out on Highway 2427 uh, because of the highway construction that's going on into downtown Albemarle. Um, I asked them, I said, how's business going? They said, well, we lost some folks in the process, but do you know where we're picking up the most folks? With our online sales. And we've got folks actually driving in from Union County and Mecklenburg County and Cabarrus County to us because one, we're less expensive. It's a nice drive and we can get here faster and get back and we like your product. Had it not have been for broadband and the access that those folks had, they wouldn't be increasing in that market. So if those folks are coming here, they're gonna spend money in other places here as well. Um, businesses face different challenges and it really depends on where they're located, I would say, throughout the county. Great, thank you. So I wanna invite people to come up to the microphone. We wanna get uh, comments in the microphone, um, if you don't mind, just to make sure it's preserved for folks who watch this later. Um, and um, you should feel welcome to ask questions that we can react to, might spur thoughts, but also to give us a testimonial, your thoughts of your experience, why it's important to you, and that sort of thing, because we're going to be communicating these stories to folks that are in elected positions and presumably can do something about it. To my friends here, I'm known as the mouth of the South, uh, so that's why I'm first. Uh, T.S. Eliot once said, what might have been as an abstraction remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. I think back 10 to 15 years, Albemarle and Stanley County had made great strides toward getting broadband in Stanley County. We were stopped. I can't help but think what might have happened over those 10 or 15 years had we had this opportunity that we're talking about tonight. The one disappointment tonight, though, is I don't like broadband as you've described it. I don't want 25 meg. I want a gig in every entity in Stanley County. And I think what I want to see come out of this, we can talk about we need education, we need it here, we need it there, but I want to see how do we do that? Do we need to put forth some sort of organization in the city, in the county, or what have you that actually does the legwork to bring broadband and a gig to Albemarle and Stanley County. Do we need a task force? What do we need uh, city employees? Do we need county employees? But somebody has got to move forward and organize it and figure out a way to get it here. Thank you for what you're doing, but I want a gig. I think that's the, the biggest area that we haven't covered yet, which is the question that I'll put to Greg and Alan in particular, which is what does a county do in the position of Stanley County? The first thing I think that works well is for you to look around this room and find who are the stakeholders, who are the people that are vested in this community, who knows the neighbors, who knows the businesses, draw those people together and create a broadband subcommittee. Let the broadband subcommittee work directly for the political leaders here in this county to cast the ideas, the suggestions, to bring them forward. That's a stepping stone, a starting point. And then those same individuals become your grassroots advocates. 
So upon the time that the development begins to occur and you need support and you need people to come onto these networks, that grassroots group, that broadband subcommittee, can be your champions out there in the community. The other thing is gauging the interest of the areas where you're looking to actually build broadband service. It's really important for you to have tools and solutions so that you can market it in such a way to find out, okay, what pocket communities do we have that are truly underserved or truly unserved. And by knowing where those areas are, you can capitalize off of the investment of the assets that are here and the stakeholders that are here to go there first and not replicate something that you already have. Because I think oftentimes we perceive that we just need to build over top of all the competitors that are here because they're just not doing a great job. Well, there's areas of their networks where they're doing a great job. And if you can isolate where they're doing a good job and go where they're not, then you can take advantage of getting broadband service to more of your people. One of the things that I wanted to note with the discussion about the federal dollars is that I don't think you can count on Washington, D.C. to solve this problem. As we look at what happened with electrification, electrification came up in the 30s after states had experimented for many years. We're seeing that right now. Different states have different experiments. I don't think we can expect the federal government to change course in the next several years. I think you're going to want to act more quickly than that. And so it's important to really take that to heart in terms of local efforts, in part because whether it's state money or eventually federal money, if you've not found a solution by then, but you have organized, you know exactly where you want it, you know that you can get people who will subscribe when it's ready, you're going to be the most attractive community if you need a subsidy, when the subsidy is available. I'll just uh, tag on to what Greg was saying. Uh, very nice job explaining what you can do locally to, uh, to show the, uh, the need. Having a survey or aggregating demand would also be very helpful. If you can show that there's a lot of people that want better broadband, whether it's businesses or whether it's residential, and you can survey the community, and you can get names and addresses that these people really want it, the uh, North Carolina uh, Broadband Infrastructure Office has a survey that's free to use for any community. It's a great way of aggregating demand, or at least measuring demand. You take that demand in front of any carrier, they'd be happy to take a look at it and say, well, this makes business sense. There's a demand for the product. We want to serve it. So I, I would do a survey. i uh, love to have other folks come up and ask questions. As you're coming up, I'll note that I, I, I feel the pain of a city that has its own electricity and is prohibited from moving forward. Dalton, Georgia was one of the first cities to build a municipal fiber network. They've served many of the rural areas around them. Cedar Falls, Iowa uh, built a cable network in 1996. They've since expanded it to rural areas around them. Reedsburg, Wisconsin, similar sorts of things. And so this isn't just a matter of looking at the impact on a city that has electricity not being able to do it. It's also a matter of um, the, the way we've seen these networks expand historically. I don't think we should expect the state to immediately turn around and, and change policies so significantly. I think we should encourage them to. But it's important to just make sure that we're getting more local authority. And as we get it, we're using it for smart things. I appreciate you guys doing this tonight. I went with. Can you get a little bit closer? Pop it up, maybe. I appreciate you folks doing this tonight. I went with Wayne Sasser back in, I don't know what month it was, to Raleigh or Cary. Uh, for the NC Hearts Gigabit Conference, and I'm, I'm, I met a few of you guys there, and uh, I was very excited to see you come here tonight because Stanley County needs to have this discussion. The problem with, and you just asked it, you had a great thing, you said, well, give a survey. Nobody in this room knows how to answer the questions on that survey. That's the problem. We live in, a, you guys just described broadband as 25 by three. That's not broadband. That's what we throw away from, no, that's not broadband. No, no one in their right mind would touch that as broadband. That's, uh, I can't run a VoIP network on, on that for two phones. I, I can't run, you cannot run one Google Nest Cam on a three mega upload. Not by Google's, not even a home. Can't run one wireless camera on a three meg connection. Not even one. I couldn't send an email while trying to look at my camera. I could do Alexa. I have six of them, by the way. I, <laughs> I share your addiction. Um, <laughs> I was trying to find an excuse for a seventh. I couldn't. Uh, Chris went the other way. So, you know, we need, so what? Utility room. Yeah, <laughs> got one there. 
Uh, Chris went the other way. Chris said, you know, we, I want gigabit everywhere because it, it's a word folks know. We don't need gigabit everywhere. We probably do need a terabyte. <laughs> <laughs> Up in the That's end. a gigabit of gigabit. You know that, right? <laughs> you know, we need um, uh, 300 by 20 is just the spectrum standard and has been for, you know, I, I can get 300, 300 by 20 for $159 all, all day long er, every, everywhere in the state. I run an, uh, an IT firm, so that's what we do. And you guys are, are using the, the examples of education, and that's a great one. Um, I ran on a let's try to get broadband and in internet better in the county, which uh, helped because everybody just kept coming to, to vote for me thinking I was going to make their Wi-Fi faster. Um, I can't, by the way. Uh, it's never going to happen. <laughs> but what uh, th the big frustration that I see on behalf of my clients all the time, and I, I really wanted to, to, add, to answer this because both of you brought it up. It is a level one problem because, but companies don't know it because they don't know how to answer your question. So I go into a business and say, hey, you paid $15,000 for your phone system. How about we put a VoIP system in for $149 a month? Jerry, you know what I'm talking about. $149 a month and you have no more overhead. Wow, I can compete with the big boys? Yes, ma'am, you can. No contract, no nothing, it's great. What do I need? Broadband. <laughs> How about we put in a, a, a surveillance system? No more need for an $8,000 surveillance system. You used all those too, Gerald, right? I, 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 I do too. How about we do one for, you know, for Google for $200 per camera, no contract, 50 bucks a year for unlimited storage. How's that sound? Wow. What do I need? Broadband. You need, I think three, those are you need 300 by 20. For ev to, to, to do everything these businesses know, don't know they need to do but want to do, they need real speed. And I hope maybe we can find a way to bring it, but, but 25 by 3 is not it. But we do need real speed. And, and we do have the people in county government here that want to help, and will help get those questions asked and answered. But we could use some direction from you guys to do it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I think it's worth clarifying. I don't think Alan would say that 25 by 3 is what a community should be shooting for. Um, it is a, a reasonable definition for a variety of reasons involving federal programs and billions of dollars and where it's prioritized and that sort of thing. But it's not getting, we shouldn't get hung up on the minimum definition of broadband. As you said, we need much more than that. And anytime you're going to build new infrastructure, you're of course going to do the best available if you're going to spend that kind of money for a long-term investment. But I want to come back to what Alan said because what you said was that we need education for the businesses and others to know what they can do with it and how they can save money and be more competitive. That's what a broadband committee would be doing in part, is, is giving those sort of opportunities. Someone like you should be, show, should be um, showing up on it. When there's questions that the committee can't answer, they should be asking NC Hearts Gigabit or my organization or a number of others who can try and provide that information. One of the reasons I wanted to do this is I feel like there are groups out here, out there with technical information that we can supply because you don't all have to become experts, but you shouldn't have to get hung up on questions that I could answer or over an email pretty quickly. So that's we, one of the reasons we want to do this was so you all could see each other and the interests, but also that you'd know that there's help out there um, for you to reach out if you have those sorts of questions and, and we can give you examples. The final thing is I mentioned the RS Fiber ex example in Minnesota. They spent years educating the community. They did 14,000 mailings of, of information out to people in the county. And I laughed and said, no one's going to read that. Who wants to get something in the mail and like read this big pamphlet about broadband? And a lot of people did. And so there's a hunger out there, and there's just a question of how people know where to, where to have it met. I think that comes back to what Anita was saying with, with we have places that can try to meet this hunger. And so the question is, are we going to do it? So, uh, please come up. Hello, uh, my name is Stacy Hale. I'm the operations president for five states, including North Carolina. Um, I actually lived in Albemarle up until about six months ago. I built a house in Rifle. I lived out on Vickers Store Road. And uh, probably about eight months ago, I was having a conversation with one of our engineers in Little Rock. And uh, we found out we had something in common. He was from Albemarle, too. His name is Anthony Walsh. And we were looking for 30 cities to overbuild fiber optic cable. And we got to talking about Albemarle, so we pulled it up on a map. We recognized that it was mostly aerial cable. So, and we were down just about every street, so we already had strand down every street. So we just quickly decided that our first city that we were going to overbuild was going to be Albemarle, North Carolina. 
I'm here tonight to tell you that in on about the second week in March, you're going to be able to get symmetrical gigabit service everywhere in the city limits of Albemarle, business and residential. And that's not where we're going to stop. Our second city is going to be Matthews, North Carolina. <laughs> and and uh, I may have missed it, but to be clear, you're with Windstream. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm with Windstream. And um, so uh, I know Alan was mentioning uh, fixed wireless. We're also going to be doing fixed wireless. The reason we're doing things like this, I think somebody captured it earlier in the comments of when, you know, you're either going to concede the space to guys like this who are very innovative or you're going to get in there and do it yourself. And our CEO took a, an approach a little bit different than a CenturyLink. And he said, you know, if you follow hockey or you follow soccer, late in the game there becomes a point where you've got to pull the goalie, right? It's game on. And so that's what we've done. We are, we are going to overbuild 30 cities out of 18 states that we serve in, and we're not going to stop there. We're going to roll out 20,000 fixed wireless uh, spots throughout our 18 states. And we're also going to deploy, and we have been deploying, we deployed 1,700 last year. We're going to deploy 1,500 this year, what we call Project Lunar. Those are CLD slams in the very rural communities. So we go to where the fiber ends. We're able to use our copper network to power sealed D-slams that offer 100 by 15, so 100 down, 15 up into the rural space. You can set those every 3,000 foot, so we're creating these what we call CSAs, circles in the rural community, and we're providing uh, broadband to those companies. We were expected to lose 45,000 lines last year. We actually gained 15,000 taking that approach. I think there's a lot of opportunities in rural America. We're also working with the USDA. I heard somebody mention the the agriculture uh, gap. We're, we're also working with them to, to partner with them and, and look at rural applications, fixed wireless, for example. And so I think companies like came here tonight, and I appreciate you coming. I think companies uh, like you guys are, are, are much like a Google. The Google effect back when we launched Gig Service in Cabarrus was everybody was scared to death because Google was going to come in and overbuild everybody. So we, we just went ahead and launched uh, Gigabit Service in Cabarrus County. It's been very successful. Um, and companies like, you know, uh, you know, Alan and, and Greg, they, they doing this, having the same effect, Google effect. So we see them coming. There, there's going to be space for a lot of competitors. We're not going to be able to overbuild everything, but I feel like between all of our companies, and I know Spectrum's in the room here. We went to a meeting in Rowan County la last week, I think, and had kind of the same conversation. But I think it's going to be a partnership with all the companies and. Uh, I know Windstream, for one, we do value the rural space. That's where we live and breathe. We're not, we're not in huge cities. Probably our biggest cities are like Lexington, Kentucky, and maybe Lincoln, Nebraska, places like that. That's our biggest cities. And so we live in the very uh, rural space. And so we're very excited to have all this uh, growth going on and spending a lot of money to, to try to, you know, we're not giving up. We're, we we want to live and breathe in the rural space. We want to kind of, you know, bridge that divide. and. Uh, provide people, and I think education is very important. I know my son goes to Jesse Carson High School, and um, he used to go to Greystone, and then he decided he wanted to go to Jesse Carson because he got tired of doing four hours of homework every night. So um, he, um, he he decided he was going to go to Jesse Carson. The first thing he did is they gave him an Apple laptop, which I thought was very impressive. But to your point, it does no good to have a, that laptop if you don't have a good connection at home. So glad to see everybody here. I just want to make sure that everybody knows I heard – Heard very passionate about getting that gig speed. Well, I'm just here to tell you about second week in March, we're going to light it up and everybody in the sea limits have mark and get it. And we'll edge out from there. I also wanted to say we're also going to build fiber to 90,000 business customers in the 18 states. That started on January the 15th. It's available now. So, you know, we're selling that to companies right now. And, and, and a lot of folks uh, qualify because if, you, if your business is within 1,000 foot of a fiber splice, then you can get it. We'll bill to you, no cost. You can get gig service. Uh, when we did that, when we looked on the, the, uh, the maps, we had 90,000 business customers that live within 1,000 foot of fiber. So we're, we're excited about that. And uh, maybe, maybe that, I don't know how close that church is to, uh, to that fiber splice, but we'll sure look at it. We'll sure look at it. But I, I, I just, we appreciate everybody's business. And I think, like I said, partnership between all the, all the cares, I think we can easily bridge this, this divide. Thank you. That's a. <laughs> you know. Uh,
So for the for the microphone, just you asked about uh, pricing, and you said it's going to be you, at the question of whether it would be as affordable in the rural as in the urban, where there's more competition. And yeah, I mean, there's going to be uh, various tiers, so you don't have to get gig. You can get uh, 100, 300, 400, 500. We're going to break those tiers up. It'd be very affordable. But I think gig initially for residential customers is probably going to be uh, around 60 bucks for gig service, and then. Uh, Probably the tiers below that a lot, a lot, you know, be cheaper, obviously. And then there we're going to go with a, uh, we're going to offer an over-the-top video product. So a lot of folks are going to that now. I think AT&T signed up 468,000 customers in the fourth quarter on their over-the-top product. So a lot of the traditional video now is going to be over-the-top. I know even Spectrum has their own uh, over-the-top uh, application, and we'll have one of those as well that we'll roll out this year. Uh, have 50 hours of uh, DVR capabilities, but it'll all work off of, of broadband. So it's a pretty neat product. I've been testing it in the office, and it's, it looks really good, works really good. Great. See Thank you. See what I accomplished in 12 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some time for um, we have, um, at least one more, and then we'll come back to this gentleman over here, who I believe is from Charter, from what I have just seen. Well, I'm an alien here. I'm from Cleveland County. I work with the COG up there. Am I moving the mic down a little bit? I work with the COG uh, there in the, in the Fort County region. But I have three questions that, I, that occurred to me as we listened here that we need to ask ourselves as we try to make this thing reality in our community. We all want our communities to grow, whether it's business, whether it's people, whether it's creative folks moving in here, or somebody just to come and build us a gas station where we can buy gas on Sunday afternoon. But three questions. Would any of us here buy a house where we couldn't get high-speed internet. The next question, for some of you, is even more important. Would your children buy a house where they couldn't get it? And for people my age, would your grandchildren buy a house in your county, in your town, and stay here and make it grow if they can't get high-speed internet? These are very personal questions. It's not education. It's not business. Those are all important. They, they, but it, the basis is, would any of us try to go somewhere? Some of our towns are going to be ghost towns in another a couple of generations because they don't have high-speed internet. Thank you. If you're going to talk about 10 gig, you know he's going to take credit for it. <laughs> well, I'm not going to quite go there. Uh, I'm Mike Tank. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Charter Communications. I cover this area. I've worked with Alan in a lot of locations and well, he, he and I have known each other for many a year now. Um, not really here to do kind of a, a commercial or anything like some of our other folks did. Um, <laughs> but what I want to do is, and I think as, as you were talking about doing a survey to understand what you do have. Well, right now in the ser charter service area, we do offer residential one gig service today. And we've offered that for the last year or so. Our basic standard service, I believe, is about 100 by 30, which is our standard rate. Uh, we offer a lot of Wi-Fi services. So I think when you look at this conversation, understand what you already have because of what we offer, what Windstream is going to be offering. I think when you're talking about the municipal limits of Albemarle, that is a different conversation than the rural area of Stanley County. Uh, those are, are different applications. The economics of servicing those areas is something that really was not addressed tonight, but uh, I know the state legislature is going to be talking about that in the upcoming session. So make sure you understand what you do have. So from Charter, you do have one gig. Now, I'm going to put the little asterisk on it. It's 940 megabits per second, not necessarily a full one gig, but uh, we do offer that at this point in time. So look at rural versus uh, within, it, within the municipality. So Thank you, Mike. I would, I would just briefly note that um, I would expand what, what Mike just said to note that there's not really one problem anywhere. And in fact, even if you're looking within Albemarle, I would agree you have multiple providers who in many areas of the city, I'm sure, are doing a good job. You may have low-income folks who are struggling. Um, they 
for various reasons. You may have businesses that have different needs from residents. And so it's important not to think of this as one problem, whether it's urban or rural. Uh, the other piece of it is that I've long been frustrated with cable companies because it's so, so asymmetrical. The upload has been slow. In several years, the cable companies will be more aggressive in uh, using a new technology that will allow them to offer very fast download and upload, which I'm excited about. But fundamentally, I don't think it changes things for a lot of cities in which they, wanna ma they may want to make sure they have a little bit more local control. And so this is where it gets beyond just the speed that's available in talking about other things. That's what we're going to be talking about. For a long time with cameras, and I'm sure up here we all remember, um, everyone cared about megapixels. I'm actually a professional photographer working for the University of Minnesota in my spare time. Um, megapixels were awesome. And it very quickly became apparent that the megapixel war was almost pointless after a certain period, and you didn't get a, the higher quality picture. But still, they advertised more and more megapixels. And so we're seeing this with broadband now, where the cable companies certainly are offering higher speeds in most areas. Um, there comes down to other qu issues of quality of service, which gets back to this question of 25.3, because you could be advertised at 25.3 and just not be getting a very high quality product. Or you could be getting a really great 25.3 that actually is going to meet a number of your needs. So it gets all more complicated, and that's why it's important to have these local conversations and know who to go to if something doesn't come through as planned. So I think I, think I really appreciate you guys coming up to the mic and sharing your company's news and perspectives. I want to make sure we have time for anyone else who wants to come up. I want to give the panel a chance to just please come on over, and then I want to make sure it's a chance for the panel to have any closing thoughts, things you struck you maybe you may not have expe expected. Uh, Dustin Poplin, um, I want to thank our elected officials for being here tonight, and I can't tell you how encouraged I am to hear this conversation here. We've been beating this for years and not seen a lot of progress. Even this meeting here, seeing the different providers come out, um, I'd love to put the chairs in and let them duke it out even more. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, this is going to benefit us, the competition coming in here finally. And I don't know if it's because we're actually having this conversation now. Uh, they, they're coming to the table or, or, you know, or it's just a huge coincidence. I don't know. But uh, I, I'm really encouraged to, to hear this. And I hope we don't just talk about it tonight, forget about it, just keep pressing on. All right, we have time. We have time for two more. You want to see if you get more claps. The, uh, some of you mentioned speeds and, and the, the pricing. Are, we, are those speeds going to be available to the whole county, or is it just going to be, you know, just a dog and pony? We have this speed, and you're going to advertise, or is this going to be something we're all going to benefit from? Okay, and that's where. I'm glad the elected officials are here. We need your help. I mean, I get it. They're in it to make money, but we need your help to get that access everywhere. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. It's thanks to Alan that we're here. And the reason I'm up here talking, I'm Mary Hoagland with Cantera Networks, is my ladies back there said, get up there. We have to let them know we're here. <laughs> So we are new to Stanley County. Stanley literally was a donut hole, a vacuum for us. We had all the school districts around Stanley, and now we just won the school district for Stanley County. So what that means is we're going to be able to leverage the fiber, the 40 miles of fiber that we're building to touch each and every school and build laterals and build rings. I think there's a school in Norwood. So we'll be Thank you, folks. Thank you for coming up. So let's just work. I'll put Kathy on the spot first to any reflections or thoughts of the brilliance that one of your co-panelists said that opened up a, a real way of sunlight for you. I'm just glad for all the great things that are being discussed tonight and all the opportunities that exist. Uh, Anita, I thank you for your thoughts and the fact that it is whole community and whole person. Uh, we have to remember everybody in this, and uh, that's, a, that's a key piece. So thank you for the opportunity. Anything that Stanley County Chamber of Commerce can do to try to help get the surveys out, collect the information, we're happy to do that. Uh, I'd just like to thank Mike, actually, for bringing up the difference between uh, more urban areas and more rural areas. It, it is really 
costly to deliver these high speeds out in the very rural areas. That's why it hasn't been done. <coughs> uh, so a lot of us are working on that problem, but uh, there's a higher cost structure. Uh, 25 by 3 is actually great if you're used to 3 megabit DSL. Believe it or not, they love it. Um, it it's interesting, in a lot of the rural communities we're in will offer 25 megabit, 50 megabit, 100 megabit. What do people buy? 25. It's like, why? You have faster speed available. And they're like, this is 10 times faster than what I had before. I can't imagine 20 times faster. And we're like, well, when you're ready, come back, because we can offer it. But a lot of people take the slower speeds. But uh, I, I think the, the point you guys were bringing up is it has to extend out into the rural areas. It can't just be Albemarle and Locust and Norwood. It's got to get out, um, out in the farms. So Pfeiffer University is uh, delighted to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's really cool to kind of look around this room and, and see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces, but a lot of folks that are just excited and enthusiastic to be part of this. So I've been inspired by you, Dr. Bramlett, uh, with your T.S. Eliot quote. I'm going to toss one back to you guys from uh, Ralph Emerson. Okay, His middle name was Waldo, but we, we all know Ralphie. Uh, he said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. And I think what we've witnessed here in this room tonight is a very enthusiastic community. And Pfeiffer is great to be part of that. I just want to thank Martha for allowing me to be a part of this conversation, even though I don't know what in the world I'm talking about up here. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank you for allowing me to just share um, my insight on what's going on. I just want to say something while we were talking about education and business. Employers, um, education, business employees, they kind of go hand in hand. Because what what's that, just today, because I was talking with my husband, he works for um, Department of Commerce. They've changed their name so many times. Used to be North Carolina Employment Security. Okay. But now they're Department of Commerce. But anyway, today, starting today, Michelin is no longer taking paper applications. And so, you know, when our kids start looking for jobs and things like that, and they're living in these various places, they're going to need access um, to be able to just fill out an application now because they're totally on, online. And even people now, he says, they have to file claims. A lot of that now is just totally via the Internet. And so if we're in these rural areas and there's no service there, it kind of interferes with people's livelihood. Um, to be able to do the things necessary just to have life. So thank you again for allowing me to be here. I think um, when I look at the amount of bandwidth consumption that's been thrown around tonight, we get hung up talking about what speeds we need and what speeds um, our children are going to need and our grandchildren are going to need. Um, I think it's really important that we focus on making sure that the technologies that we create in these areas are long-lasting technologies. They're technologies that are going to be able to handle the growth. Because if you think about when this whole Internet thing started, everybody was pretty happy with a 14.4 or maybe even a 96 baud rate dial-up modem that made that little de dong de dong noise. That was great, and we thought that was all we needed. And then all of a sudden, we started using it a lot more. And then... We had to have something faster, and then we started using it more, and we had to have something faster. And so that same progression is going to continue. Uh, we're going to want to eat as much as we can eat, and the technologies that are being built are going to consume it. So just make sure when, as elected officials, as you're thinking about what needs to be built in your county, it needs to be something that's going to be able to grow with the changing tide and the consumption of the end user. Thank you. I wanted to also thank Martha Sue, who may have disappeared. <laughs> it was wonderful the first time jumping on a phone call, having a sense of just the enthusiasm coming out. And um, I was also struck that I wanted to thank um, the Uori Bank, which I may have just brutalized the pronunciation. I'm not entirely. All right. Um, community banks are hard to find increasingly in communities. And um, knowing that Dawn had the time to put into this on behalf of the bank is, um, is really helpful and really makes a difference. So I hope you all can appreciate that you do have some assets here that, that others don't when you're looking at how to solve these problems. So um, please join me in thanking the panel.
And there's time for networking if you all want to talk to each other, talk to us. Um, you know, I won't be rushing out, so happy to answer questions. And we have the space reserved for a little while. Thank you all.